welcome here tonight. Um, it's an auspicious occasion. Um, this book that you've all got a copy of is the first monograph that we've actually published as a uh, think tank. So, um, in particular, I'd like to thank David Cox, who um, uh, had the idea that we should do something in this area and um, allowed me to convince him that he should uh, fund Brendan Markey Taylor to, to do this book. So thank you very much, David. Um, I hope it's the first of many, not the last of one. Um, federalism is a very important issue and it's something that we've taken an interest in uh, and done some work there and you might have seen in the paper this morning that the State Treasurer um, is a little bit concerned because the way the Commonwealth Government doles out the money, uh, because he's clipped the resource companies for as much tax as he had <laughs> has, uh, that he may well lose uh, some of the GST distribution. Um, so I put out a release today saying, this isn't how Federation's supposed to work. We've been trying to convince the government that perhaps GST ought to be distributed on a per capita basis to the states or as a percentage of gross state product. There's a couple of arguments one way or the other. Um, but that it shouldn't be done on the basis of penalising those states who are more innovative and do better, which is what happens at the moment. But that points to an underlying problem that we've got in Australia and that we've got a federal system and we've got a whole lot of unwilling players in the system those players being the states. Um, you've all heard various state premiers talk about the blame game. Uh, well, the blame game is really them wanting to disclaim any responsibility for the cost of fixing a problem, but wanting to, at the same time, claim the credit for it. So they always say, well, we can't fix it because the federal government isn't giving us the money. That's not the sign of a, a healthy uh, federation. And some of the, the most successful economies in the world are federations. You know, just think of the United States, think of Germany, think of Switzerland. Um, and um, if you think about the world, I think the world's been successful because a few countries, if you think of it, it's a federation of countries. Uh, and some countries have stood out as shining lights and other countries have copied them. So the genesis of this book was that when COVID came along, suddenly every state start, started behaving like a colony again. Mm, yeah. And you couldn't get out of Western Australia for, for love or money. And, and when I say love or money, uh, uh, Clive Palmer spent a lot of his treasure trying to win a legal case there and the High Court wouldn't back him. So it seemed to be a perfect opportunity um, to look at how the states were dealing with COVID and see what lessons we could draw out of that and perhaps push the barrow for a a more fair income version of federalism in this, uh, this country. Unfortunately, Brendan can't be here to launch the book uh, and speak to it. Um, but um, fortunately, uh, Jean Tunney has, uh, has stood into the, uh, the breach. Uh, Jean's not the author, so he doesn't necessarily share all the author's views. So that could make for some interesting conversation later on between him and me, and between <laughs> you and him. And if the author gets to watch the, uh, the broadcast that Dave Pellow's uh, doing for us, uh, maybe even between Brendan and you. But um, <laughs> there isn't anyone that I can think of better to do this oh, than Jean. Uh, Jean's written the book about Queensland, Beautiful One Day Broke the Next, I, Correct, th yes. I think was the oh, name. Yes. Uh, he's certainly an expert in Queensland state finances. Uh, he's worked in the bureaucracy as a as a um, economist managing um, people oh yes i was looked after the cash of the commonwealth government many that's, years ago that's yes. right yeah <laughs> yeah uh, some experience so so he he brings a uh, a view which combines both the federal and the uh, the uh, yeah. unitary to the, uh, the subject so gene over to you very good thank you graham Thanks everyone for coming. It's a, it's a great pleasure to launch this new monograph from Brendan Markey-Towler, COVID-19 and Australian Federalism. 
The first year, our grand experiment with 21st century government, I'm really happy that it had its origins on my blog. So Brennan wrote a post, a guest post on my blog, Queensland Economy Watch, and then it grew into, uh, into this monograph that, uh, that has been launched tonight. So I'm really happy with that. And I've enjoyed the discussions I've had with Brendan over the last couple of years about it because we have slightly different views on COVID and, and federalism. Look, Brendan, I think, makes the best possible case one can have for an Australian federation, for the states playing an important role in forming policy, in regulation in a federation rather than a top-down uh, decision making from the federal government. And I think it's really impressive in, in that regard. So Brennan's argument is that federation allows for this national coordination, cooperation by the national cabinet, you'll recall the national cabinet, the PM and the premiers and the chief ministers getting together, deciding policy. So we have the national top-down, we have the coordination, but we have the bespoke policies, we have the responses suited to the local community, reflecting the preferences of the local community. And I think it's really good that Brennan points this out. So Brennan sees this response that we had during the COVID period as the new Premier's plan. So the Premier's plan was the response in 1931 to the Depression. The Premier's formulated after Jack Lang, Ted Theodore, they had their own sort of radical policies towards how the, the states would deal with the Depression, the Premier's plan, debatable whether it was better or not, but uh, perhaps not as radical as what Lang and Theodore were arguing for. So Brendan takes the, the spirit of that, he sees that as, uh, as the, uh, the inspiration perhaps for what he calls the new Premier's plan during the pandemic. So we can come back to that later, there's a lot of debate about the, new, the, the actual Premier's plan during the Depression. And essentially, what he argues is this new Premier's plan was the best that we could have done during the pandemic. It was much better than a national top-down plan dictated by the Prime Minister. This is his argument here, and I think he, he makes the best case for this that could be possible. And Brennan writes, Despite interstate border closures contributing to some ugly episodes of state jingoism, here, here, it was a superior approach to a single policy imposed from Canberra by the national government. So I'll, I'll provide my own views on that assertion a bit later. I think he rightly, what Brennan does well, I think he contrasts the, the more rational, sensible, measured approach from the New South Wales government to more draconian, what would you say, cruel or knee-jerk responses from some other governments, particularly in Victoria. And, I, and he argues that New South Wales, partly that was because you didn't have a chief health officer running anything, you had the, the minister responsible. So he contrasts that approach with what you saw in Victoria. Uh, and to an extent, in, I mean, in Queensland, we had our own issues with the interstate border closures. Uh, but, uh, you know, Brendan's a bit sort of... It's difficult to see what he thinks about Queensland in it because Queensland, on the one hand, we did shut out people, but we had fewer lockdowns, which was good. So it's a, it's a difficult thing to judge. I mean, my own view is though those, lockdown, those uh, border closures were incredibly cruel, restrictive. We shouldn't have had them and we could have had better policy. Uh, but... Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I agree. But under the Constitution, they could get away with it because the Constitution only protects interstate trade. So, look, I agree. Absolutely. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but, yeah, it's New South Wales and Victoria. He makes that big contrast between to make his case. What I like about his book is he also talks about how the Queensland experience with economic development from the probably the mid-60s when Leo Hilscher became a deputy under-treasurer through to the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, that great era of economic development in Queensland, he talks about how that is a good example of how federalism 
enabled diverse responses across states that allowed Queensland to go its own way. So I think that's a good example as well. So rather than a top-down approach from Canberra, have a state which can have lower taxes than other states. I mean, Sir Joe famously in the late 70s cut, got rid of the death tax, the inheritance tax, and that brought a lot of investment, brought a lot of people up from southern states into uh, Queensland, particularly to the Gold Coast, the old white shoe brigade and all that. So, uh, very good. Uh, so, I think, I think Brendan's example of, of what happened in, the, in Queensland is a good one. I think federalism does allow that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, full marks for identifying that. We had a government which had development-friendly policies and we also had you know, very high-caliber officials, people like Leah Hilscher, uh, Sidney Schubert and uh, Frank Moore who ran the... Queensland uh, Tourism Corporation in the 80s. So uh, I, I love that about Brennan's books. So things I really liked about Brennan's book, so this is worth reading, especially just for the historical detail. I mean, amazing historical detail about the history of the Australian Federation. I don't know how many people know this, but uh, the, in the early part of the 20th century, in the first 20 years of Australia, the High Court read the Constitution in a very... Uh, they read it in terms of what the Founding Fathers intended, which meant that a lot of powers resided with the states. And then in 1920, when Robert Menzies prosecuted the engineers' case for the engineering union against Adelaide, Adelaide Steamship Company and some other uh, various other employers, the, the scope of the Commonwealth Government expanded uh, to, to encompass... because the High Court essentially said, well... We will read the Constitution literally. We won't think about what the Founding Fathers considered. And that led to the vast expansion of the federal government over the 20th century. Now, partly that was related to the war, the Commonwealth government taking over the taxation powers during the Second World War, but it was also due to a more expansionist reading of the Constitution. The Tasmanian Dams case, reliance on the external, external affairs power. We sign a treaty. We sign a, a treaty in Ramsar in Iran. And then that suddenly determines what we can do in Australia. Uh, so um, Brendan is very good at bringing out all of that historical detail. And so he sees this great trend in the 20th century towards greater federal power. And then he says, well, well we had the pandemic and then suddenly it changes. And the states have a much greater role. And this is a resurgence. This is a revitalization of federalism, which is something that not a lot of people defend. I mean, I'm a former Commonwealth bureaucrat and my bias is towards federal, it's, it's towards greater national power, centralization. It's not towards federation. It's not towards the power of the states. I see the states, I think they're not running things efficiently. I think the Commonwealth can do it better. We've got the money. We, we've got the talented people. Why do we need the states? But Brendan makes a strong argument in his book for federation. And uh, the other thing I really like about it is he draws on the various theories of federalism, the writings of Alexander Hamilton, of, uh, ja of uh, James Madison, and economists such as Charles Thibault and Eleanor Ostrom to make the argument about why federalism can be better than a top-down, national, centralised government. So I think that is really impressive with, uh, with Brendan's monograph. So really, really impressed with that. Now, I must say, and Brendan alludes to this in his Ford, that I'm not entirely on board with his, his thesis. Like I, I consulted with Brendan. He, he asked me for my opinions on it. I would like to, I would like to say I, I'm totally on board with everything I say, but I must, uh, and I, I value his contribution to the debate, and I think his argumentative powers are impressive, but I do disagree with a few things. So I'll talk about that briefly, and this is meant to stimulate debate and discussion, particularly with Graham, because I know Graham will disagree. It's not meant to be critical of Brendan, because I think Brendan deserves praise for this, this really great monograph. Uh, but where I differ with Brendan is that he argues that, he argues in support of this grand experiment with 21st century governance, whereas I would argue it was actually a failure. I think it could have been a success but I think it failed in the absence of strong national leadership. 
In my view, the PM failed to reign in the States. He figured it would be politically disastrous to do so, given the prevailing panic about the COVID epidemic. The federal government initially supported, but then backed out of Clive Palmer's bid for free movement across states, which I thought was dreadful. I mean, that would have been, that's what the federal government should have been doing. It should have been encouraging free movement across the state. And furthermore, the federal government arguably contributed to the continuation, the likelihood of punishing lockdowns because of the financial support it was offering. So the federal government was picking up the bill for the state's economically harmful policies. So look, I know where Brendan's coming from and arguably we could have had a better policy with federation rather than nationally consist the a nationally imposed policy. But look, it's not clear to me the new Premier's plan was a superior approach to a single policy imposed from Canberra by the national government, which is Brennan's argument. So I think this is where we, we can have a discussion, where we can have a, a, a debate. And this is why I welcome this monograph, because it's putting a, a firm proposition that we can discuss and contest. Personally, I suspect we, wait, we, uh, we may well have had a better response, a less cruel, arbitrary and inconsistent response if, uh, if, we ha if Canberra actually provided leadership. I know this will be controversial. I'm a former Treasury official, so I'd probably say this, a federal Treasury official. Uh, but my view is that there's more light shone on the federal government and there's more scrutiny from Senate estimates, people like Malcolm Roberts in the Senate, uh, and, and various journalists who will challenge the federal government, whereas in Queensland, in Victoria, much less scrutiny. Uh, it took basically Peter Credlin turning up to a press conference in Melbourne before Dan Andrews ever had to respond to anything. So, I mean, that's just my view. Um, I welcome Brendan's contribution to this debate. And again, these remarks are offered as a means of stimulating discussion rather than criticism. I think Brennan's done a tremendous job with his monograph. I recommend you read it to understand his arguments, where he's coming from. He's a great believer in, in federalism and in this polycentric approach. Arguably, New South Wales was doing very well until the contact tracing failed. So you could argue, well, it would have been great to be in New South Wales for that time versus Victoria, definitely, under dictator Dan. Uh, but look, I think it's still an open question as to whether federalism is a superior approach to a national government. Uh, but all of that said, I think Brendan does mount an impressive case for Australian federalism. And I'm very glad to declare the monograph launched. So thank you. I'll take questions, but I'd sort of put it to you that the case that Brendan's making is one which works on the percentages. Um, I don't think that a federal government on, under a unitary system would have necessarily acted any differently because they would have then come directly under the pressure from the various states. But I think Brendan might also take it a step further and say, well, yeah, when that happened, you had Scott Morrison and he might have been a little bit more liberal, but say Dan Andrews had been Prime Minister. Yeah. So how do you, you, you come at that from your um, centralising perspective? Yeah, that's a good question, Graham. This is where I think the, the greatest scrutiny on the national government comes into play. Look, I mean, I honestly don't know. I mean, we can't rerun the experiment. We don't want to rerun the experiment for sure. Uh, but look, I can understand the arguments for federalism, but the arguments for federalism often depend on that free movement of people. And this is the Tebow hypothesis that people vote with their feet and go to the jurisdiction that offers the best mix of services uh, and taxation that, that is best for them. What, I really, what really irked me and what, what I really annoyed me during the pandemic was just the border restrictions. I thought they were incredibly cruel and, and arbitrary, like if you're a sports star or whatever, a movie star, you, you could come to Queensland. I mean, that really annoyed me. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's what I, I... I thought that there was a violation of one of those fundamental assumptions around the benefits of Federation. Yeah, I, well, if you talk about border closures, 
it would be an interesting experiment to get the figures for infections with COVID and deaths in mm. Tweed Heads versus Coolangatta. And I think you'd find that they're a pretty similar figure, like very close to zero. Mm. So that suggests that the border didn't actually yeah, achieve yeah. anything because yeah. there was free movement up to the border yeah, yeah, on yeah. both sides. Um, but um, just behind... Yes. I used to teach economics and I've read your book twice. Oh, thank you. Very good. I once caught a plane uh, to go to Sydney, got the mascot airport, got turned around by the New South Wales health, health officials and was sent back the same day. And was observed sitting there for three hours by the New South Wales police. Uh, the uh, raising, uh, the question really is about the border closures. Yeah. Now, Canada and the USA had, more, had similarly severe problems with the COVID crisis. To my, to my knowledge, there were no closure of borders in the USA between states and to my knowledge there was no closure of borders between the Canadian provinces. Um, these are both systems of government similar to ours. Mm. They are federal systems of government. Germany to my knowledge has a federal system of government. There were no border closures between the German Länder as they're known as, L-A-N-D-E-R in German. What can be done to solve this problem once and for all, to stop border closures? I thought Section 92 would be stronger than it turned out to be. I think if you read, I was stunned that uh, that, that wasn't more effective in blocking that. So the free movement of commerce or trade or whatever it is. And, and I thought Clive Palmer had a good case. So I was very disappointed when the Commonwealth Government backed away from that. I don't know what you could do other than a constitutional amendment. I mean, now that the, the states have done this and they've established a precedent, we really need some sort of constitutional amendment. But w will that happen? Probably not. So, yeah, we're in, yeah, it's very disappointing. Yeah. I'm not sure that a constitutional amendment would get you there. I mean, what could be more plain than it should be? Was it absolutely free yeah, between the states? Your I problem, I think your yeah. problems with the High Court there, yeah. which is yeah. a question of who gets uh, appointed yeah. to it. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I thought you made a good point about um, America and Canada, so and Germany and and the Federation. Maybe we should talk. I've, I've got a question here and one there, but maybe something we should talk about was how the Federation worked in America. Maybe there's a a further sort of argument to look at between what we did here yeah. and what happened there. But I'll, I'll just. Put well, that could, off to one side. But can I just say, I think Brendan's argument is stronger the more diverse your federation is. So if you're in the States, you've got 50 states, you've got someone like, somewhere like Florida, mm. which has a very liberal policy, and I can move to Florida, and there's no Anastasia Palaszczuk is not stopping me from moving to Florida, mm. then great. Yeah, I, I believe in that argument. I think it's less, I think it's more applicable in the States than it is in Australia. Yeah. Sorry, Mick, I... Oh, mine's more of a comment than a, than a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think possibly might be overthinking it. Wasn't it totally poll driven? Yeah. Uh, 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 every premier could smell the re election yeah. opportunity, and uh, the keeping us safe theme was so strong. Yeah. Uh, federalism, uh, 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 you know, I think they were turning up at the national cabinet, uh, uh, you know, not, not carrying their weight. Uh, they went back home and, and just. Uh, could smell, uh, you could tell it in, with the health ministers, they, they were there like puppets. Yes, very quickly. Um, I don't think that the states, <coughs> excuse me, let me put it the other way, Morrison would have had any chance in uh, telling the states what to do without appearing the worst hypocrite in the world. He had already blocked the borders to Australia for citizens to return. I mean, you know, interstate travel is a piece of cake compared to that. Okay, so is anyone wanting to ask any questions of Jean? Because I think... Oh, Barclay. Oh, Barclay. Oh, sorry, Barclay. Oh, no, no, you need this. The microphone is to hook up to... Okay, the understood. Um, yeah, g'day, Jean. I know a lot of the discussion has been about border closures, and, yeah, I definitely agree with 
your point that competitive federalism only really works if you indeed have the ability to freely move between the states. I assume that's, that's roughly what you're getting at there. Yeah. Um, the other dimension of this that I wanted to ask about was a lot of people were looking at Scott Morrison and his inability to um, intervene when the premiers impose vaccination mandates. To your opinion, in your mind, um, was there a mandate for him to intervene and stop the mandates or was he completely beyond his purview to even intervene in that respect? Look, honestly, I don't know what the constitutionally what the, the right answer there is. Uh, yeah, honestly, Barclay, I don't know. I mean, I, what I would like to have seen is Scott, Scott Morrison providing greater national leadership. I think a national approach would have been better legally as to who had the power to do that. I honestly, I honestly don't know. But uh, I, think, I think Morrison lost... Uh, he lost the opportunity to provide national leadership. He saw the polls. He was backing Clive Palmer's push for open borders early on and then went against that because he saw that, you know, the fear, the, you know, the fear mongering was so popular. And then when Palaszczuk had the big win here in 2020 and who else, uh, was it McGowan had a big win too? Yeah, there was just no possibility. Um, yeah, I don't know about the legality of it. It's a good question. Historic, historical question. You uh, mentioned National Cabinet, mm. that like it was something that had uh, existed uh, sort of since soon after Federation, but uh, that only came into existence a few years ago. It replaced... Oh, yeah. um, I just forget what the mechanism was, was called. Um, COAG? COAG, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and then this whole thing of um, the APRA and AFRA and the whole national cabinet artifice was all set up to, I, I gather, to try and bring about control. Um, so I was just wondering what it was you were referring to historically that you sort of thought that there'd been something like that from Oh, no, from, Brendan was talking about back. the Premier's plan and the Depression. So he right. was looking back to that. So now he, historically there, yeah, I guess we've had uh, attempts to get national cooperation through, yeah, COAG. There was a Premier's Conference before then. But Brendan argued that this was something new. This was a resurgence of, of federalism, of the rights of the states. We hadn't had that since, in, in real terms, since the Premier's plan and the, the Depression, which was a plan that, the premiers came up with in the depression to deal with the depression, which was less deflationary than what Otto Nehemiah from the Bank of England had come over to advise the government had recommended. So there was a plan and it was, a, yeah, so he was arguing that this was a new premier's plan. So this was the strongest, uh, what is it, uh, example of the strongest, uh, yeah, the strongest uh, yeah, example of federalism since the Premier's plan. That was Brendan's uh, argument. But yeah, we, up until COVID, we, the, the trend was toward greater federal control because we had the states lose income tax in the 40s. Then we had the Tasmanian dams case in the early 80s, which meant that the Commonwealth could do whatever it liked, whatever it liked if it could point to a UN convention or a treaty. Because you could say, oh, well, there's the Ramsar Treaty, which means we have to protect wetlands, which means we have power to, you know, block any development that threatens a wetland, so, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what Brendan was arguing. This was, the, this was actually the first resurgence of federalism, of the powers of the states, since the Premier's Plan in 1931, where the states developed their own plan that was in... Uh, that, that was counter in a way to what was being advocated by Otto Nehemiah from the Bank of England to the, the federal government. Yeah. Gene, just your, your comments really, I suppose. Uh, I'm looking at the fact that Australia, 123 years later, still only has six states. And yes. uh, you're comparing it to the US, which started out with well, 13 and they're now up to 50. Canada yeah. in their constitution provided for growth in the number of provinces or states. 
to what extent do you think that's limited Australia? And, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's nothing that's very easy to change, but it uh, seems to me that we're limited by the fact that we've still only got six states and we've, there's less opportunity for that sort of competitive federalism uh, as a function of that. Yeah, I think, this, I think that's a good, good question. Uh, I, I grew up in Townsville and so I'm, I'm very... Um, I'm very supportive of uh, a North Queensland state. I recognise that actually North Queensland's probably been doing very well out of getting subsidies from the south, but uh, I could see benefits in having uh, your own state. I'd, I'd go, people in Kansas say have it in Kansas, I'd go have it in Townsville, the capital, and then you could have, <laughs> yeah, you could have them set their own policies, lower taxes, more uh, favourable economic development conditions. So I think that's true. I, th I think that's what you need. I think Brendan's argument is sound theoretically and intellectually, but I think what it needs is that more states. So if you had more like the United States and you had, you had places like Florida or South Dakota versus California or New York City and they want, you know, New York, they want to have more restrictive policies, but yeah, we're, we're going to have more liberal policies in Florida, South Dakota. That's great. Let's have that. We didn't have that, though. I think part of the point of this was to start arguing yes. that we should have more of that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, back in uh, 1931, when mm. the, uh, the states were busy making their own uh, uh, efforts to fix the Depression, uh, if I'm right, they had the income tax yes. flowing into their own coffers. Yeah. So they had the independence to do that. Yeah. And then 1940, was it? You said the income tax after you know, for World War II was yeah. granted to the federal government. Yeah. Now, um, my understanding is that since then, I can't remember which prime minister was, but one of them offered income tax back to the states. Malcolm Fraser. Yeah. And it was turned down. I'm interested in your comments on that whole thing. One, the significance of the fact that the states had income tax back in 31. And secondly, why is it that you think they refuse to take it back? Oh, I, I can mean, tell it's... you why they refuse to take it back. So, yeah, I um, well, I was on when Malcolm Turnbull uh, floated floated that at uh, the prior to the Coag meeting. Steve Austin had me on his show the next day, and I said, oh, I think that's a great idea. I mean, this helps address that vertical fiscal imbalance we have. The fact that the Commonwealth raises all the money, gives it to the states, the states spend it as they as they wish. And there's that problem of accountability. And I thought, that's terrific. Um, I read Malcolm Turnbull's autobiography. It says that Anastasia Palaszczuk told him at the dinner at the lodge when she rejected this proposal that, oh, we actually like the current system because you raise the taxes and get all of the, the, the criticism for that and we spend the money and get all the credit. So that's... Yeah. that's <laughs> so, I mean, she's a brilliant politician, Palaszczuk. <laughs> Actually, there must be something about the name Malcolm because my memory says Malcolm Fraser also um, uh, wanted the states to take back some taxing yeah, he powers. Did. He did. Yeah. Yeah, he did. So he had the yeah. two Malcolms yeah, yeah. pushing for it. He did, yeah, yeah. John Howard was a bit more of a centralist, I think. Yeah, yeah. 